Today, the responsible lending misdirection. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. On Friday the 19th of February, the Senate Economics Legislation Committee began its hearing into its inquiry into the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment, open brackets, supporting economic recovery, close brackets, Bill 2020, which seeks to repeal responsible lending obligations and extend the best interest duty to more credit assistance providers, among other changes. But it's the switch of focus from the bank's responsibility when it comes to making, for example, a mortgage decision, to putting all of the onus on individuals, despite the fact that that really was hardly touched on through the hearings. Now, the chief intention of the removal of the responsible lending obligations as set out by the federal government, is, quote, to reduce the time it takes for individuals and small businesses to access credit and streamline lending regulation. But in fact, the arguments posed by government was that credit availability was a problem and this would make credit more readily available, despite the fact that credit is booming just at the moment. Now, under the changes, the bank will still be held to laws that ensure they are assessing a borrower's capacity to repay the loan without substantial hardship, as outlined in the Prudential Regulators APS 220 standards and other lending laws, but they won't need to investigate information provided by the borrower. The, the changes to the responsible lending obligations seeks to remove the financial regulator's oversight of the bank's lending assessments. And that's partly in the light of compliance disputes brought to the fore by the Wagyu and Shiraz case between the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, ASIC, and Westpac. Indeed, as the court didn't agree with the financial regulator's interpretation of what lenders should be doing to adhere to the responsible lending laws, the new bill would, in effect, remove ASIC's responsible lending remit, with the regulator no longer authorised to exercise its enforcement powers. Now, ASIC, of course, was pretty much the only regulator, maybe other than ACCC, who had any interest in consumers' protection. Certainly, APRA doesn't. Now, fronting the committee on Friday, the CEO of the Australian Bankers Association, Anna Bly, said the legislation should be interpreted in a way that allows the banks to give less weight to expenses that would be reasonably viewed as discretionary versus expenses that are fixed. However, the guidance that is attached to the legislation through ASIC that is not what it says, and banks, I think quite understandably, take the more precautionary approach, she said. And she said, it is precisely the treatment of discretionary expenses that are at stake here. And I would argue that, in fact, the government's reforms, in effect, gives effect to the Wagyu and Shiraz case. This is actually about saying, let's put the Wagyu and Shiraz case back into what was probably the intention of the parliament in 2010, when the responsible lending laws were set, by clarifying that there should be one regulator, not two, and that it's the regulator that has the most flexibility. It still requires banks to do the right thing, and it's still providing powers for consumers to enforce when things go wrong, but providing sufficient flexibility for banks to treat different customers in different ways, depending on how long you've known them, how much they are paying, and what their repayment history looks like, etc. That said, she did concede that the current arrangements have not throttled credit supply, which, by the way, was the original claim made by the government and the RBA. And that really begs the question, so why remove these responsible lending obligations at all? New owner-occupied loan commitments rose 
0.8% in October 2020, more than 30% higher than October 2019. If you don't have the data, okay. well, you can take yeah. it on notice. And, and commitments to the construction of new dwellings rose 10.9% and was the largest contributor to uh, October's owner-occupied uh, October's owner-occupier housing commitments. And finally, in October, the, uh, the number of owner-occupied first home buyer loan commitments increased by 3.4 per cent to 13,481 seasonally adjusted, which is more than 30 per cent higher than any pre-COVID month since 2009. So can you tell me why we need this legislation again? I mean, credit appears to be flowing exactly the way the government wants it to all manners of uh, all groups in society who want to buy a house. There appears to be a, uh, a boom going on rather than a uh, curtailing of access to finance. So despite the things that you've raised earlier in the piece, they do not appear to be constraining, particularly the housing market. So I'd like your view on that. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. It is not um, the view or the assertion of uh, the ABA or its member banks that uh, the current provisions are choking the supply of credit. Uh, and I would say two things in relation to your question. Uh, our submission goes very much to the, the individual experience of customers. That macro data tells us that, yes, credit is getting into the economy. What it doesn't tell us is what was the experience for those customers who were fortunate enough to get the credit they needed? Did they get it in a timely way? Uh, did they get it in the most efficient way? Did, were they required to jump you know, several paperwork hurdles that add nothing to the value and quality of the credit assessment process? Uh, did they get it in a timely way that allowed them to buy the property that was the right one for them? Did they, um, and, 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 or did they miss out for re, or were there people, people there that missed out when they could have accessed the credit. The second thing I would say about um, data from 2020 is how important it is to remember the extraordinary amounts of stimulus that state and federal governments have put into the economy generally and more specifically into the housing and construction sector. Now, I, th I totally agree that that stimulus is important, it's necessary, but if we're setting laws for the next decade, I don't think that the construction sector will necessarily see that sort of stimulus all at once from different levels of government. So as I said, this is not, uh, that is not the position of the ABA. Uh, banks are doing everything they can to make the current laws work as effectively as they can. The question I think before the committee is, can they make it better? Can you improve the process for customers? Should customers be having to reconstruct their spending on takeaway food for a three to six month period in, a, in order to get a loan when that factor is of really no value to the credit assessment process. It's become a battle over the role of ASIC, but in the crossfire, the protection for consumers are being, frankly, eroded significantly. And while the finance and property industry have been largely supportive of the repeal of responsible lending obligations, citing its ability to improve the flow of credits and reduce the amount of red tape in the loan writing process, some concerns have been raised by some non-bank lenders, as well as members of the Labour Party, senators and consumers groups, and of course I made my own submission. Witnesses called to the Senate hearing on Friday included representatives of consumer and financial counselling groups who reiterated their concerns that repealing the current laws would reduce consumer protections. Well, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to appear on behalf of the Consumer Action Law Centre. Uh, Consumer Action made a joint submission to the committee's inquiry with nine other not-for-profit community legal centres and consumer groups, including Financial Counselling Australia, whom I'm appearing with today. Uh, debt stemming from unaffordable consumer credit is one of the most common issues both our financial counsellors and lawyers assist people with. We hear these stories on a daily basis. These debts can arise from all forms of credit, and too often loans were unaffordable for the borrower from the start. We are therefore dismayed that the government has put, before, uh, put a bill before Parliament that would dismantle existing responsible lending laws, which we fear will lead us to another debt disaster. Responsible lending laws are a vital consumer protection 
that help ensure, helps ensure lenders do not sign people up to unaffordable credit they could never afford, or which does not meet their requirements and objectives. As Commissioner Hayne said in his Royal Commission interim report, responsible lending laws are critical in, quote, enabling the confident participation of consumers in a lending market in which, in which both consumers and lenders trade fairly and in good faith. And in his final report, the very first recommendation was, was that the law should not change. And Commissioner Hayne also said, my conclusions about issues relating to the credit law can be summed up as apply the law as it stands. Importantly, the existing law requires lenders to undertake reasonable inquiries and reasonable steps when it comes to suitability assessments. This allows for flexibility in how lenders approach their obligations. What is reasonable will often be affected by the particular nature and amount of the credit contract in issue. Our written submission outlines how this bill, if enacted, would reduce consumer rights and accountability for lenders. I won't repeat those concerns here, but I'm happy to take uh, those in discussion. The central aspect of the government's bill is to remove individual suitability assessments and only require lenders to have policies, processes and systems to address risks associated with lending decisions. I would like to show you, uh, share an example of what this looks like in practice. Our client, who we will call Ben, wasn't protected by responsible lending laws under the current regime and the outcomes for him were disastrous. Ben was on the disability support pension when the loan was made. The loan was for a vehicle and was written up by the lender as a business purpose loan, meaning responsible lending protections didn't apply. Ben did want to start a courier and ride share business, but in reality, the car has been used for personal purposes. The loan repayments were unaffordable for the, from the beginning and Ben made a complaint to AFCA, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. AFCA was not able to consider responsible lending laws, but it did look at obligations on lenders outside of this, such as the obligation to be a diligent and prudent banker. AFCA determined this obligation requires the lender to have systems, policies and processes in place, but that a detailed assessment of Ben's financial situation was not required because the lender's policy did not, requ did not require that. As such, Ben was unsuccessful with his complaint and has now been referred to homelessness services due to the risk of homelessness associated with not being able to make payments on this debt. If responsible lending laws are repealed, there will likely be the same outcomes for many consumer credit complaints. Finally, I just want to touch on the provisions of the bill relating to payday lending and consumer leases. I want to be clear that this bill does not deliver on the federal government's own commitments to implement the reforms recommended by the 2016 small amount credit contracts review. That review made recommendations that were designed to promote financial inclusion for lower income and more vulnerable people who may be excluded from mainstream credit. The review report said that unaffordable credit arrangements do not provide for financial inclusion and that both the cost of credit and the repayments of credit need to be affordable for financial inclusion to be achieved. Unfortunately, the changes now proposed compared to amendments previously considered by Parliament, fail on this objective of financial inclusion. The proposal is to double the 10% protected earnings amount cap recommended for each payday loans and consumer leases for most consumers, um, and to allow lenders an extra 20% establishment fee to be charged with consumer leases on top of already generous markups. This will mean that these products will continue to be unaffordable for many, making it likely that people will continue to be trapped in a cycle of high cost credit that is difficult to escape. And when asked whether the Financial Complaints Authority, AFCA, could take over any individual grievances with lending decisions, Mr Brodie replied, Africa's role is to resolve disputes between consumers and financial firms. It is limited by its rules, or one of its rules says it cannot consider complaints about credit decisions. It's actually excluded from its jurisdiction. And he continued, what it can't do is to make any sort of determinations based on the quality of that decision, because that'll be outside its remit. So while consumers complain to AFCA, AFCA's ability to resolve those disputes will be really limited. And we can expect that consumers will not get a remedy through complaints to AFCA regarding individual credit assessments. 
And he later added, it's an important distinction to be made in the sense that AFCA is not a law enforcement agency. It's there to resolve relatively small disputes. It has caps on how much compensation it can order. It has rules that excludes a number of disputes. That's very different from the role that's currently performed by ASIC, which is there to regulate conduct in individual lending decisions. What flows from that is that ASIC can effectively get an institution to the point of setting up a large-scale remediation scheme, as we've seen. That's not something that either AFCA or indeed APRA will be able to do under the reforms. Was there any contact or discussion between a Treasury or um, government personnel and your organisations in the preparation of this ledge? Um, certainly not before the announcement. And I would contrast that, to be fair, to um, other significant reforms. Um, we enjoy, I would say, a very constructive relationship with Treasury and with the government, and we've supported a number of really important reforms in recent years. Um, and I think that the sorts of reforms that have gone through, some of which have been discussed earlier in this hearing, um, have been better as a result of that, consult uh, that conversation, that consultation, that commitment to process. But there's been no such um, process here. There was a very brief Treasury consultation after the official announcement, and um, the next step was the introduction of the bill. Mm. Thanks, Mr Kirkland. Ms yeah, Cox? I would agree with that. The first I heard about it was when it was leaked by a journalist the night before it happened. Um, and contrast that to my experience of the current laws. I was involved in many of those Treasury um, consultations, and so were all the major lending industry bodies, broker industry bodies, lenders large and small. It was a really extensive consultation, and the same thing happened with the enhance enhancements to the bill that happened a couple of years later. Um, Mr Kirkland, I think you've been here for some of the uh, earlier witnesses, and you'll know that we've discussed at different points the macroeconomic impact of a change of this kind. Um, there was some evidence from um, representatives of the housing industry that constraints on consumer fi finance are holding the sector back. Um, I wonder if you have any observations about that, given your remarks about the scale of lending at the moment uh, for both established homes and new homes. Well, there's. Um I think the evidence is very clear. I mean, the, the regular publication of ABS data shows that home lending is going up. Um, new home loan commitments in December 2020 were 31.2% higher than the previous year. So that's a comparison to pre-COVID conditions, 31.2% jump. The number of owner-occupier first home buyer loan commitments was up 56% year on year. Uh, and then if you break it down state by state, if you see um, WA as perhaps being a lead indicator, you see very different figures in WA. Total home finance is up 83% year on year in the December figures. Now that should be ringing alarm bells across the country. It certainly doesn't suggest there's any problem at a macro level. It says that credit is flowing very freely and we actually need to be worried about some of the risks if some of those trends continue. Mm. Um, every reform has winners and losers. You've been involved in a number of substantial um, economic reforms. Who are the winners and who are the losers in the reform that's before us now? And what, how does it compare to previous reform projects? This is, well, I can't imagine anything of this scale that would have been introduced in this way, but in terms of scale, it is, it is massive. It is the largest giveaway to the banks that I've seen in the decade, over a decade I've been involved in um, discussions about regulation of financial services on behalf of consumers. And it's an, an enormous transfer of risk from lenders to, to borrowers. Um, and if you want to put an economic figure on that, I mean, the $350 million in remediation is, it's not the best indicator of value. That's only the cases where, um, where there was a remediation program because it was picked up and, um, and the, the lenders agreed to that. There would be many more cases where, under the current laws, in fact, people have been protected without us seeing it because it did act, the laws have actually deterred some of the riskier conduct that will come back if these laws return. So this should not be mistaken. This is one of the largest um, financial services reforms that I've seen and the one that will create the greatest risks to consumers and it will translate in real loss of money by consumers. Yes. So take that question. I, um, look, obviously, I think that the, the, the losers here are going to be consumers who end up laden with too much debt. But obviously, we all lose out eventually if there are economic impacts and it slows down the recovery. But I think in the short term, 
the banks are going to be the winners if we remove these rights because there's you know one less um, regulator overseeing their conduct. Um, there are less options for consumers to take action, less requirements for them to remediate consumers. But also, I think that they have been suffering, at least some of them, from failure to invest in their systems. So we have seen some lenders in the market out there who are actually very quick, even under the current law, to give loan approvals while still doing all the things that the law requires. And I think by, by doing this, the lenders see this as a way of actually being able to get back in the game. Um, and similarly, Karen Cox, the CEO of the Financial Rights Legal Centre, said she was concerned about removing assets oversight of the bank's adherence to lending laws, stating, I would like the laws to be as they currently are, enforceable by individual application and for compensation to flow when they've been breached, so that we're not entirely dependent on one regulator. I would like there to be two regulators on the job doing the different jobs that they were set up to do. One to look at system stability and the other to look at conduct because I don't believe that the system regulator is going to have sufficient resources or inclination to deal with the conduct issues. And Mr Brody also highlighted that ASIC has conducted numerous systemic reviews into lending practice over the last 10 years, including for credit card lending and reverse mortgages, which had resulted in wholesale changes in lending practice without the need for enforcement action. And he outlined that should ASIC's lending oversight be removed, it would no longer have that role and those reviews would cease. But on the following Friday, the 26th of February, the Senate Economics Legislation Committee concluded its hearings into the inquiry. Treasury fronted the Senate Committee to deal with some of the concerns and clarify the government's position on why the repeal was, quote, necessary. Speaking to the Senate Committee, Treasury Chief Advisor Markets Group Amy Oster commented, when listening to the contributions from witnesses called before this committee, including specific cases that suggest evident misconduct, it can be noted that there are other legal remedies in the Credit Act available to consumers who experience misconduct by either ADIs or non-ABIs. And Ms. Oster outlined that the courts may determine that a contract may be unjust if the credit provider knew or could ascertain through reasonable inquiry that the debtor could not repay the loan without substantial hardship. And she also emphasised that the changes to the Credit Act made by the repeal of the responsible lending obligations would actually raise the legal bar from ensuring loans are not unsuitable to ensuring that the consumer had capacity to pay without being placed in substantial hardship. And the Chief Treasury Advisor for Markets continued, there are a number of other provisions of the law that support consumer protection, including unconscionable conduct, as well as general conduct obligations that require licensees to do all things necessary to ensure credit activities are engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly. Potential remedies to these matters could include injunctions, payments of amounts, potential to avoid contracts and damages. And she said the legislation was developed using a set of guiding principles that included maintaining a legal requirement that lenders undertake a sound credit assessment in each individual credit decision, maintaining the test for sound credit assessments as being whether the credit would result in the consumer being unable to meet their obligation or only able to meet their obligation under substantial hardship, maintaining regulatory neutrality between ADIs and non-ADIs in respect of consumer protection, enabling scale and flexibility for lenders while retaining consumer protection and maintaining consumers' access to dispute resolution and redress through AFCA. And similarly, Simon Wrighter, the First Assistant Secretary of Treasury, added, really the obligation on the lenders hasn't changed a great deal in the proposed bill because they're still required to make an assessment about the appropriateness of the credit for the consumer and they are really required to make that assessment before providing credit. So in that sense, the obligation remains consistent across all categories of potential borrowers. Really, the question for the lender is that they have a sound basis on which to make that assessment and that they'll be guided by the APRA standard. And there will be a clear set of rules issued by the regulator to make clear to them what's the required expectation of the test is that they should be applying when offering credit to consumers.
And Treasury also emphasised that since the responsible lending laws were put into place over a decade ago, additional legislation had been passed that afforded more protections to consumers from harm, including the incoming design and distribution obligations, which have really been aimed at and I believe have reduced some of the more egregious examples that we've seen in the past. And the Treasury told the Senate Economics Legislation Committee that overall, the Treasury noted that while consumer advocacy groups favoured a more prescriptive approach in regulation on balance, industry stakeholders were strongly supportive of recalibrating toward a principle-based regime. Well, no surprise there, huh? She said information provided to Treasury through consultation suggests that regulatory guidance has evolved towards a credit assessment process that is often more onerous than is necessary to establish the credit position of many customers, this costs consumers time and effort. The government's objectives is therefore to revitalize the principles-based framework that retains the benefits of responsible lending practices without imposing the added costs of unnecessary regulation. This particular proposal is about addressing the time and effort that it takes to receive approval on a credit assessment or to undertake credit assessments and have that come to a decision not necessarily about the overall supply of credit. But the point they skated around was this. Currently, the bank has a clear obligation to validate applicants' claims when making a loan. In the new world, the obligation lays firmly with the consumer. And indeed, if it is found subsequently they did not disclose any material facts, they might be sued. In other words, it puts the asset on consumers, even if they are not fully across all the details, allowing the lender to step away, unlike today. So there is a real shift in obligation. And finally, the APRA rules are focused on mortgage portfolio management and risk to address financial stability, which is totally different compared with the responsible lending obligations, which is down at an individual customer level and specifies some of the things that banks should be doing to validate loans and loan applications. So, in a way, a lot of the arguments made to the committee were, I think, misdirected. And that fundamental question about consumer protection got fudged. The Senate will now consider the submissions received during the consultation and the evidence given during the hearings to complete its inquiry into the repeal of responsible lending, which is expected to report back to the Chamber on the 12th of March 2021. And the point I want to leave you with is this. Banks, of course, want to lend. Banks, of course, want the minimum processes that they can get away with. And the fact is that APRA is only concerned about structural financial stability, not individual consumers and their lending experience. Unfortunately, there is no champion other than ASIC looking after consumers' interests. And as ASIC is being turned away from that role under this proposal, nobody but nobody is on the side of consumers. And that's a big deal because at the end of the day, under the new legislation, it's the responsibility of consumers to disclose all the information to a bank so the bank can make a decision. But if that information is in any way incorrect or inappropriate, it leaves the door open for the bank to then sue the individual. So it really does change the landscape completely and puts all of the obligation back onto consumers. And that, in my mind, is not a fair bargain. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.